Let's summarize college probability in 15 minutes. We first need to establish the basic rules or axioms of probability. The big three rules include the probability of an event A lying between 0 and 1, the probability of the entire sample space equaling 1, and the probability of a union equaling the sum of the probabilities. This is known as countable additivity. To deal with the unions of two events that do overlap, we will apply the inclusion-exclusion principle, which is upper bounded by the sum of the probabilities. We can derive a similar formula for n different events, which is rather complicated, but will also satisfy the union bound, the sum of the probabilities. A key instance of probability can be defined using combinatorics, where we have the addition principle for counting, the multiplication principle for counting, the complementation principle for counting, which helps us define the probability of an event by the number of items in the event. When considering events sequentially, one wants to consider the notion of a conditional probability, which is defined by the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of the event assumed. This helps us calculate the probability of both events happening via the probability of the first event happening, followed by the probability that the second event happens assuming the first does. We can generalize this idea to the law of total probability, which helps us decompose an event into easier cases to work with, which helps us derive Bayes' theorem. In some sense, it helps us swap conditional probabilities. If, however, the probabilities aren't affected by one another, that is, the probability of the events happening at the same time is simply the product of the events, we say that these events are jointly independent, which will be useful for further calculations later on. Random variables, denoted by x, help us measure the outcome of an experiment. If the random variable takes on discrete values, it is defined by a probability mass function, and if it takes on continuous variables, it is defined by a probability density function. In either situation, we can define the cumulative distribution function. It represents the probability that the random variable, capital X, takes a value that is not more than the value, small x. What's fascinating is that if x is a continuous random variable, then differentiating the cumulative distribution function actually gives us the probability density function. There are several common random variables, some discrete and some continuous, that we will commonly encounter in college probability. These include the Bernoulli distribution, the binomial distribution, the geometric distribution, the Poisson distribution as our discrete random variables, as well as the uniform distribution, exponential distribution, and normal distribution for our continuous random variables. A really important question to ask is what is the average value of the random variable as well as how much it varies. We can define the expectation of a random variable essentially as a weighted sum in both the discrete and continuous cases. We can generalize this definition to compute the expectation of the random variable capital X composed with the continuous function G. This helps us define the variance of the random variable, which is the expectation of the squared error from the mean. And the standard deviation of x is defined by the square root of the variance of x. Using our seven common distributions, we can run through these definitions to calculate their expectations and variances respectively. Suppose, however, that the random variable capital Y is related to the random variable capital X. Then the CDF of Y is precisely the CDF of X. This means that differentiating with respect to Y on both sides, we can obtain the PDF of Y in terms of the PDF of X. We take the PDF of X divided by the magnitude of the derivative of G. This denominator is known as the Jacobian, but more on that later. A really important question 
is what happens when we consider two-dimensional measurements of an experiment. This is known as the joint random variable xy. If x and y are discrete, we can define their joint probability mass function in a similar manner as before. And if they are jointly continuous, we can define their joint probability density function in a manner that is essentially a two-dimensional analog of what we did just now. Likewise, we can define the joint cumulative distribution function as the probability that the random variable capital X does not exceed the value small x and the random variable capital Y does not exceed the value small y. Just like before, if the random variables x and y are jointly continuous, then taking the derivative with respect to y followed by x helps us obtain the joint PDF of x and y. Akin to conditional probability is the idea of conditional distributions, which follows a similar definition when x and y are discrete. More generally, as long as we know that either the PMF or the PDF of y is positive, we can define the conditional PDF of x given y. Just like before, we can do a bit of algebra to obtain the joint PDF in terms of the conditional PDF of x given y. Analogously, we have a law of total probability, this time by integrating the right-hand side, and we have an analog of Bayes' theorem in terms of conditional PDFs. Once again, in a sense, we can swap conditional distributions. And just like before, if the joint PDF factorizes, we say that the random variables are jointly independent. And just like before, we can define the expectation of a joint random variable essentially as its weighted average just like before. This helps us define the covariance between x and y, which measures how connected the random variables x and y are. Interestingly enough, the covariance of a random variable x with itself must be the variance of x. And this helps us define the correlation coefficient essentially as a scaling of the covariance. This idea in particular helps us demonstrate that the expectation of a sum of random variables must be the sum of the expectations. And similarly, the variance of a sum is the sum of variances including the covariance term. What's even more fascinating is that if x and y are independent, we can actually derive the distribution for their sum. This is known as function convolution. Using this, we can show that if x and y are both binomial distributions, their sum must follow a binomial distribution. Likewise, if x and y are Poisson distributions, then their sum must be a Poisson distribution. Finally, if x and y are normally distributed, then their sum must be normally distributed as well. Suppose now we have the two-dimensional random variable y1, y2 in terms of the two-dimensional random variable x1, x2. Rather remarkably, we can still find the distribution of y1, y2 in terms of the distribution of x1, x2. We divide it by the magnitude of the Jacobian of the two-dimensional function g1, g2. This is defined by the determinant of a matrix, where each term is a derivative of one of the functions in terms of one of the variables. We can simplify all of this by representing y1, y2, g1, g2, and x1, x2 as vectors. And this notation looks rather similar to the one-dimensional situation. If we have conditional probabilities, do we have conditional expectations? It turns out that if x and y are either both discrete or both continuous, we can define conditional expectations in a rather straightforward manner. We can generalize this definition to consider the conditional expectation of g of x given the random variable y, and this helps us define the conditional variance of x given y, just like before, as the expected squared error from the conditional expectation, assuming the value of y. This actually helps us obtain many conditional expectation properties, with the most useful being the tower rule, where the expectation 
of a conditional expectation is just the vanilla expectation itself. Furthermore, we can sometimes factorize conditional expectations as well as decompose the unconditional variance in terms of conditional variance and conditional expectation. These generalized expectations help us define the moment generating function of the random variable x by the expected value of e to the tx. It actually helps us obtain the expected value of x via the first derivative. This is known as the first moment of x. Rather surprisingly, we can obtain the second moment of x by differentiating a second time. We can keep doing this until we obtain the nth moment obtained by differentiating n times and then evaluating at zero. Our seven types of distributions have their own MGFs and these MGFs can be used to prove several connections between the random variables. In particular, we can derive several limit theorems, which roughly speaking helps us control the size of the random variable probabilistically. The first inequality helps us upper bound via the first moment, and this is known as Markov's inequality. The second inequality helps us upper bound using the variance, which is in some sense a modified version of the second moment. This is known as the Chebyshev inequality. And in general, we can upper bound it using the moment generating function. These inequalities help us make sense of the sampling distribution of n independently and identically distributed random variables. The weak law of large numbers tells us that the probability that the difference between the sampling distribution and the expected value being larger than some error term must approach zero as n gets large. The strong law of large numbers tells us that this convergence will happen with probability one. And the central limit theorem tells us what distribution we obtain in the long run. It turns out we actually re-obtain the normal distribution with mean zero and variance one. These are the core ideas of college probability in a nutshell.